following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In Hinduism, the primary representation of divinity is Krishna. Although Hinduism is a vastly sophisticated and complex religious tradition with hundreds or even th thousands of variations, different branches and schools, and many, many ancient scriptures that describe many different aspects of religion, we find a central theme throughout all Hinduism that describes the supreme manifestation of the divine. One of the most beautiful characteristics of the Hindu tradition is its recognition that God is ultimately nameless and formless, but as an expression of love, takes different forms and appearances in order to aid humanity. Thus, the Hindu tradition embraces and respects all gods. The Hindu tradition embraces and respects all religions. And this is a very beautiful characteristic of the Hindu tradition. Of course, Hinduism is one of the oldest religions that survive on this planet in this age. And counted among its treasures are the oldest writings of humanity, which are, of course, scriptures, and the longest writings of humanity. Many Westerners think the Bible is one of the longest writings in humanity and one of the oldest, but it's neither. Hinduism has both the oldest and the longest writings. Today we're going to study one of the most important representations of divinity in the Hindu tradition, Krishna. Krishna is, like in any religion, a, a character or a symbol that has many different aspects, different meanings, different levels of importance, and different interpretations. And of course, over the centuries, the character of Krishna has been understood by people at many different levels. Some accurate, some inaccurate. For Westerners, Krishna may appear exotic and hard to understand. But in Asia, Krishna is a very uh, ubiquitous presence, even amongst Buddhists, Taoists, and other types of traditions. Krishna is a recognized figure and plays a role in many different religions, not just in Hinduism. The myth of Krishna is complicated, rich, and profound. We find, of course, in Hinduism that this character of Krishna has uh, taken on many different levels of meaning. Just as in Christianity, we nowadays find 
that many Christians relate to Jesus only as little baby Jesus. So they've reduced the character or symbol of Jesus to something uh, related with family life, something very simple, and that, that does not uh, communicate the entirety of this divine symbol. So here in India, these images show you Krishna as a babe, getting in trouble, being breastfed, similar types of symbols. These are not the types of symbols of Krishna that we find to be important in Gnosis. It's not what we'll discuss in this class. Of particular importance to us is that Krishna, as a master, as a person, is said to be the eighth messenger of Vishnu. The word messenger in Sanskrit is avatar. And nowadays, some people think this word avatar means something other than what it really means. And there are now many people claiming to be an avatar and claiming to be divine incarnations on earth. And they deck themselves with jewels and gold and want to be worshipped. But this is not the meaning of avatar. The real meaning is messenger, someone who delivers a message on behalf of God. As a person, as a human being, there was a man named Krishna who still lives. The man Krishna, the master, came several thousand years ago, long before Jesus of Nazareth. And he came in order to deliver a message to the peoples of Southeast Asia. And that message is still being circulated today. Krishna as a man, as a master, is a very great master. But we're not gathered here to talk about him. Really what we're interested in is the message that he was delivering and the originator of that message. In this image we see the originator is represented as Vishnu. Vishnu is just one of the many symbolic representations of God in the Hindu pantheon. And you see gathered around Vishnu many of his messengers, most from the past, but some also from the future. Vishnu is just a symbol, a symbol of an aspect of the divine that reaches out in order to help humanity. And it's stated in one of the Hindu scriptures, through the mouth of Krishna, that he comes into the world any time religion declines and degenerates. He comes into the world in order to give the message to guide humanity back to the light. And he does that according to the time and need of each age, with a different face, with a different language. But it's always the same message. This is what's represented in that image. In the Hindu scriptures, you'll find many stories about Krishna. Probably the two most important are the Mahabharata, which is the longest epic poem written that we know of on this planet. It is an ancient, very extensive, and very beautiful scripture. Mahabharata means the great warrior. And the whole poem is about a great war amongst the gods. Krishna plays a central role. The other scripture that's most known in relation with Krishna is the Bhagavata Purana, in which many of his exploits and stories are told. Today we're going to talk about the Mahabharata. There is one little section out of the Mahabharata that is one of the most important scriptures in the world, and it's called the Bhagavad Gita, which means the Song of the Lord. And this is an epic, beautiful poem of instructions that Krishna gives to his disciple, Arjuna. In relation to all of this, we find a, an excerpt from an Upanishad called Gopala Tapaniya that describes divinity in a very beautiful way. The scripture says, the one supreme personality of Godhead is hidden within everything. It is all pervading. It is in everyone's heart. 
It witnesses everyone's activities. It lives in everyone's heart. It is the witness. It is the consciousness. It is transcendence. It is beyond the modes of nature. This passage from this Upanishad, which is a type of scripture in Hinduism, describes what really every religion attempts to present to us poor mortals, which is that beyond the scope of our physical senses is a level of intelligence that pervades everything that exists. That level of intelligence is the root and source of everything that is alive. In Hinduism, it is called Krishna. It is not the master. It is not the person. It is not a baby. It is not one man. It is an energy. Krishna is Christ in Greek terms. Krishna, or Christ, is the fire that lights everything that lives. Everything that exists is illuminated by the fire of Krishna. So in Gnosis, when we talk about Krishna, this is what we're talking about. The root of all existence, the very fundamental basis upon which there is something. The name Krishna, of course, is Sanskrit, and it means black. It can also mean dark blue. It basically means something very dark in color. Naturally, many fanaticized Westerners, when encountering Hinduism and discovering that the chief divinity of Hinduism has a name that means black, became scandalized and accused the Hindus of being devil worshippers. And this is just a symbol or a result of the fanaticism and fear and misunderstanding in many people's minds. This is why Krishna is represented with blue skin or very dark skin. And we can see in this image that Krishna stands in a very relaxed pose playing a flute. And behind him is a cow. These images are symbolic. Unfortunately, nowadays, many take them as literal and really think that there is a person with blue skin who plays a flute and protects cows. This is not the meaning. This image is symbolic. It is intended to be used for meditation and can reveal many beautiful truths about Christ. If you study religions, then you know that many of the greatest prophets, Christified masters, as representatives of Christ, were protectors of sacred animals. David, Jesus, Heracles, all protected cows or sheep. They were shepherds or cowherds, even the Buddha, whose name Gautama reflects that origin. The cow represents the Divine Mother. The cow represents nature. The cow represents what gives us life, the milk of life, the amrita, or ambrosia of the gods, which comes from the udder of the cow. Krishna is the protector of the cow. Christ protects his mother. We find this in Isis and Horus. Isis is represented as a cow with her cow horns. She is the one who gives life, and her protector is her son, Horus. Horus is Krishna. It's the same symbol. The reason that Krishna is described as black or dark blue can be seen when you study the night sky. Christ is the origin of all life. It is the field upon which Everything that lives blossoms and grows. To us, the night sky is black. Which is very odd when you consider that the sky, the universe, is filled with suns that irradiate enormous volumes of light. How could that be black? It's illogical. 
If the universe is filled with glowing suns that are emitting immeasurable amounts of light, why would it be black? It's only black because we don't have the eyes to see that light. It's too bright. We're blind to it. We can't see it. It's a level of illuminous, luminosity that is beyond our vision. It is black to us. But if we had the eyes that could see it, the universe would not be black. Krishna is called the black god in the same way that Osiris is called a black god amongst the Egyptians. And his spouse is Newt, Isis, the Divine Mother, who is the sky. That fundamental emptiness from which stars are born. So Krishna, or Christ, is the light that emerges in the darkness. The darkness does not understand the light. Our mind, our perception, doesn't comprehend the light of Krishna, Christ. We see black. In the Bhagavad Gita, Christ, or Krishna, incarnated in a human being, taught his disciple Arjuna. And Arjuna represents the human soul, our consciousness, our essence, who rides in a chariot, which is the soul itself, led by four horses, sometimes five, but usually four. And those horses represent many things, the solar bodies, the tattvas, the senses. The meanings are psychological. The whole story of the Mahabharata is about a great war. And when that war is about to be commenced, and Arjuna is there on the battlefield, about to go into battle against his very relatives, against the people he loves, he hesitates and says, Krishna, my guide, my friend, my teacher, I can't kill my family. I can't kill the ones that I have known and loved throughout my existences. I can't do it. I can't comprehend that. And so the whole Bhagavad Gita is Krishna's teaching to Arjuna about the great war. The spiritual war. The war inside of ourselves against ourselves. True spirituality is about conquering our own defects. Those aspects of ourselves that we have nourished and cherished for lifetimes and that we feel our, our inner family, what we've known and loved for centuries. And when the moment comes when we face real spirituality, we feel, I can't kill myself because I am all I know. How do I kill myself psychologically, spiritually? It's too scary. So Arjuna gives the answer. We have to appeal to Krishna, to Christ, for guidance. And the lesson that Krishna gives is very deep and beautiful and profound. Study the Bhagavad Gita. The scripture can guide you very deeply through many important aspects of your spiritual work. This painting shows Krishna revealing his true form to Arjuna. Because Arjuna is having a hard time understanding who Krishna is, how God fits into all of this, and why we must die. Why is it that we have to die psychologically? Why is it that the ego is wrong? Why is it that we have to conquer lust and anger and pride? And the only way that Arjuna could understand that is to understand what does not have those qualities, which is the pure consciousness. We cannot really proceed in our psychological work to eliminate pride unless we really know what humility truly is. It's impossible for us to conquer lust until we realize that it is an affliction, a source of suffering, and we have seen and tasted what, it's, what it should be, which is chastity, which is true love. 
We cannot conquer anger, resentment, until we've really understood compassion, love. So in this painting, Krishna shows Arjuna his multifaceted truth that Christ explodes into existence as everything that exists. Every God, every divinity, every flower, every plant, every animal, every planet, every sun is an expression of Christ's light, of Krishna. And this vision so moves Arjuna that he comprehends religion and he comprehends the great war and then he's prepared to go into battle. This is why in Gnosis we emphasize the importance of developing the capacity to perceive the divine. We develop that capacity through learning how to meditate. Real meditation is a state of consciousness in which no ego interferes with our perception. No ego, no desire, no attachment, no pride, no lust. Pure consciousness, perceptive and seeing the reality. As long as we don't have that perception, we are in confusion. So this vision in the Bhagavad Gita represents the type of vision that we need to achieve, be given by God in order for us to advance in our work. Upon seeing this vision, Arjuna exclaims, O limitless one, God of gods, refuge of the universe, you are the invincible source, the cause of all causes, transcendental to this material manifestation. You are the original personality of Godhead, the oldest, the ultimate sanctuary of this manifested cosmic world. You are the knower of everything, and you are all that is knowable. You are the supreme refuge above the material modes, O limitless form, this whole cosmic manifestation is pervaded by you. So this event, this narrative event in the scripture, is a moment in which Arjuna, the consciousness, perceives Christ without any filters, without any ego. It is consciousness freed, perceptive of reality. This is a samadhi. It's a beautiful, cognizant comprehension of the nature of Christ. And there's an entire chapter in the Bhagavad Gita in which Arjuna describes his vision. And it's overwhelming, especially to the intellect and to our personality. It's overwhelming. The experience of that transforms the, the soul, the consciousness. So Krishna says about his identity, earth, water, fire, air, ether, manas and buddhi, egoism. Thus is my prakriti divided eightfold. This is the inferior prakriti. So these elements that he lists are called in Sanskrit tattvas. A tattva is just a vibration of energy. It is a modification of Christ. We've explained throughout many lectures that Christ is the root energy in everything that exists. That energy descends into manifestation. It crystallizes, it condenses, and it takes different forms. And in that path, of condensation, it becomes differentiated as earth, as water, as fire, as air, as ether. These are five modalities of matter and energy that vibrate in different dimensions and that give rise to everything that exists. Our physical body is a very specific combination of those five ethers or those five tattvas. So is the body of a god but with a different vibration. So a great master like Krishna or Moses is comprised of the same elements, but at a different level of vibration. This is important to understand because many Hindus read these scriptures 
and read that all things are Krishna, and they assume, well, we're all enlightened. It's wrong. The tattvas manifest in different levels and vibrations. We are not the same as gods. We have the potential to become gods, but we are not there. Manas and buddhi are related with aspects of consciousness, of the soul. To understand this better, we can look at the tree of life. The tree of life shows us how the structures of nature are represented in Kabbalah. At the very top of the tree, this structure of ten spheres, we see three rings. The Ain, the Ain Sof, and the Ain Sof Or. These three are really one. They are the absolute. They are abstract space. They represent the unmanifested, uncreated light. They are Krishna at the highest level. They are pure potentiality. When those, because of karma, because of disequilibrium in the energies of nature, have to express and give rise to creation, a light emerges, which is the Ein Sof Or. These are Hebrew words, by the way. The Ein Sof Or means the limitless light. In Sanskrit, we can call that Adi Buddha. It can also be called Krishna. The first expression of that is Keter in Hebrew. Keter is also Krishna as the supreme personality of God. Keter unfolds into Hokmah, which means wisdom. That is also Krishna, the pure wisdom aspect of God. That is also Bina, the third sphere, which means intelligence. That is also Krishna. These three together are the trinity in every religion. Keter, Hokmah, Bina, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. The three logos, the trinity, the cosmic Christ. Those three are Krishna. That level of existence is archetypal. It is the preparatory stage for manifestation. It is the level at which there is a blueprint, there is a map, there is a potential, but it isn't created yet. When it emerges and finally creates, we see the rest of the tree of life, these seven spheres below. Those are all the other dimensions in nature. The seven below are different modalities or condensations of the tattvas. In other words, the light of the Ain Safor that gives rise to the solar logos, Krishna as the supreme godhead, which can also be called Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, that trinity, creates. And that creation is the lower prakriti, the inferior prakriti, that creates the dimensions of nature. You see, those top three and the absolute are dimensionless. They exist, but they do not exist. We can call it the zero dimension. It's beyond our intellect to grasp the real meaning of that. But when they create, the dimensions come into play. The first is the sixth dimension, the most subtle. In that level, we have in Kabbalah, Chesed, Gebra, and Tiferet. Those are the Kabbalistic terms for that level of nature. In Sanskrit, chesed is called atman, which means self. Gebra is called buddhi, which strictly translated means intellect, but it does not mean our intellect. It does not mean the intellect that we have here as terrestrial people. It really refers to consciousness at a divine level. It is a type of intellect that is pure intuition. It doesn't reason. It knows. So it's intellect 
from an Asian psychological perspective, not Western. And Tiferet is Manas in Sanskrit. Manas can also be translated in various ways, but it's generally translated as reasoning, mind. But again, it is not our mind, our reasoning. The way we experience it. This is abstract mind. Intuitive mind. Manas, which in Hebrew is Tiferet, is Arjuna. from the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is the human soul, the pure consciousness, who questions God, saying, please teach me. I can't fight this battle. That's Arjuna, Tiferet. So in this explanation, when Krishna says, earth, water, fire, air, ether, manas, and buddhi, he's talking about how all of that emerges out of him and becomes these lower levels. And those aspects are pure. But the last one, the eighth, ahamkara, which translates as egoism, the I, pride, lust, anger, greed, envy, gluttony, fear, laziness, etc. It's strange to read in a scripture that Krishna becomes egoism. But it happens because of us. You see, this tree of life does represent nature, and it represents the dimensions outside of us, but it also represents us. These levels that are displayed on the tree of life are in us. And in moment-to-moment -moment existence, Krishna is flowing through us. It is the fire of life. It is what is giving life to every cell in us. It is the energy inside every thought, inside every feeling, inside every sensation. It is Krishna. We corrupt it. Our body comprised of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. So is our mind. So is our heart. So is our soul. Manas and buddhi are the divine soul, Geburah, the human soul, Tiferet. But in us, they are trapped in Aharamkara, egoism. So he explains further that distinct from this, know thou my superior Prakriti, the very life, O mighty armed, by which this universe is upheld. So look at this map of the tree of life and realize there are two aspects that Krishna is describing as himself. The superior aspect, which is the top trinity, and the absolute. And the inferior aspect, which are the seven sephiroth below. Superior prakriti and inferior prakriti. So then the question becomes, what is prakriti? We see we have two aspects, and we understand something about how nature is manifested. But we need to know what prakriti is. This is a Sanskrit word that means nature. So obviously we have nature outside of us. And if you're a little bit observant, you can see that we are corrupting nature outside of us in really a very terrible way. Can you go anywhere on this planet and find a place that is unaffected by human activity? None that I know of. Not even in the Antarctic or the Arctic, which are completely inhospitable to human life. We find pollution, chemicals, garbage. There are scientists who go up there who find garbage, plastic bottles, trash that's been blown around by the atmosphere. They find chemicals, gasoline, rocket fuel. 
the air is poisoned, the water is poisoned, the entire planet is poisoned because of ahamkara, egoism. So if our exterior nature is polluted, why? Because the nature inside of us was polluted first. It has spread out. This is why Samael Anvior stated in many of his books that our external circumstances are merely a reflection of our internal ones. What's happening to us in our external lives, around us, our circumstances, our problems, the pollution and the wars and uncertainty and economic hardship, are a reflection of our psychology. And our problem is we refuse to recognize that. We want to change what's outside and not change what's inside. We are Arjuna, who cannot bear the thought of having to confront our relatives, our own psyche, our own defects, our egoism, ahamkara. We don't want to face it. Nonetheless, Krishna explains that we need to understand these two aspects of prakriti in order to understand him and to understand ourselves. Prakriti means nature. So now we know it has two fundamental aspects. The superior, which is the ocean of life that sustains all existence, and the inferior, which is the condensation of that. Prakriti means nature. It is the divine mother nature. Prakriti is feminine. Prakriti is the cow that Krishna protects. Prakriti is Isis Nut, the Divine Mother. In this particular image, we see Tri Devi. That name means the triple goddess in Sanskrit. It is that superior aspect of the tree of life, those three circles. Keter Hokma Bina, but seen feminine. You see, Krishna is not male. Krishna is not a man. Krishna is an energy. Krishna is beyond male, female. Krishna is Prakriti, nature. This triple feminine symbol is Krishna, displayed as a woman with three aspects. It's beautiful. This is one of the things I love most about Hinduism, is it really shows nature in all its glory. Prakriti, then, we see has these two fundamental modes, superior and inferior. But how it functions, it has three modes. The first one, is creation, which in Sanskrit is rajas. This is the ability of the light or fire of Krishna to create. You remember that quote from the Upanishad stated that the Supreme Godhead is in everything. It is the root of everything. It is the source of everything. How is everything created? Well, if we look at our own nature, because we are a reflection of the nature around us, how do we create life? Through sex. This is the only way we can create life. Through sex. Rajas means or relates to creation. But the word itself is extremely difficult to translate into English because it, it has a very rich, deep implication. It means energy in motion, energy in activity. It is projective. It is masculine. It impels. It drives. It pushes. It is passionate. It is virile. It is um, powerful. It is unstoppable. It is undeniable. Rajas is difficult to translate. 
It is an irresistible energy that pushes and motivates. It is at the very basis of existence. When the entire universe is about to be created, when there is nothing in existence, it is rajas that emerges and impels creation. Rajas creates universes, not just ants and bees and moths and little human beings. It creates infinites. It is the projective, creative aspect of nature itself. It is very energetic. It is all of the power of the gods to create. The second aspect or mode of Prakriti is the one that sustains existence. In Sanskrit, it is called Sattva. Sattva also is very difficult to translate directly to English. There is no word that conveys all of its meanings. It means sustainability, perpetuity, continuity, balance, harmony, equality, sustenance. It is the energy that preserves, the energy that harmonizes that conciliates, hmm? that brings together, that molds and shapes. And the third one is tamas, which means destruction. Tamas also very difficult, if not impossible, to translate into English. Tamas implies destruction, disintegration, decay to bring down, to take apart, to remove, to be lethargic, to be slow, to stop moving, to go backwards, to be in retrograde, to devolve. All of that is tamas. So if you look at these three together, you see a circle, a wheel. You see the wheel of nature. You see how every living thing is created, brought to existence, Sustained, maintained, managed, and then destroyed and decayed. Consumed once again by nature. These three together are called gunas. G-U-N-A-S. The three gunas. These three aspects of prakriti are beyond the tree of life. That upper trinity on the tree of life, Keter Hokma Bina, manifests only because these three are out of balance. These three gunas are not the trinity. They are not Keter Hokma Bina. They are what give rise to Keter Hokma Bina. They are what give rise to the Ain Sof War. The three gunas are three energetic aspects of the absolute. But these three gunas reflect in everything that's created. The trinity is a manifestation of the three gunas, and they work through the three gunas. That's why we see in the trinity, Keter Hokma Bina, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We see a projective force that creates. We see a preserving force that sustains. And we see a destructive force that removes. These three in Hinduism are usually represented as Shiva. Shiva is that energetic, dynamic aspect of God that creates and destroys. In the Bible, this is Jehovah. That part of God that creates and destroys. These three gunas are modalities of energy. We have them too. Every one of us has one of these temperaments. We tend to be a rajasic type of person, very energetic, very, you, not, I wouldn't say creative in an artistic sense, but very productive. We're very energetic, always having to do things and be active in motion, psychologically, not necessarily physically. 
We may be sattvic, which means that we're very balanced, always trying to balance and equilibrate things. We might be tamasic, more lethargic, slower paced. None of these are better than the others. They're just three temperaments in our psychology. And these apply to how we eat, how we live, how we act, and our sex life too. So Prakriti has these three modes in everything that happens in every level of existence. So Krishna says about himself, about these two aspects of Prakriti and the Gunas, all created beings have their source in these two natures. Of all that is material and all that is spiritual in this world, know for certain that I am both the origin and the dissolution. There is naught else higher than I, O Dhananjaya. In me, all this is woven as a cluster of gems on a string. This is Krishna saying, everything that is born and dies is me. Everything. Even impurity. From the gods to dirt. Everything has in its nature, in its essence, Krishna, Christ, light, this energy. Everything originates out of that and returns back to that. But its means of return is different. So he continues, O son of Prita, know that I am the original Bijam of all existences, the Buddhi of the Buddhi Matam and the Teja of the Tejasvanam. Okay, I left these words in Sanskrit on purpose. I didn't put them in English because the English doesn't convey the meaning. The meaning of these terms is really important. And all of the scriptural excerpts I was building up to are for this scripture and the next one. Krishna says, know that I am the original Bijam of all existences. Bija is a Sanskrit word which means seed. Bijam means the original seed, the primordial seed, the ultimate seed. So again, let's take nature as our example to understand what this means. Krishna is not saying that he is a sesame seed. Krishna is saying he is the ultimate seed of all that exists. So what does that mean? Well, if Krishna is in us and is our origin, what is our primordial seed? Where did we come from? Sex. People don't like to talk about that. We like to just skip over the part about our parents having sex. And like to go back to say, well, we came from God, or we came from Adam and Eve, or we came from some gorilla in the jungles a long time ago. Those are all theories. We need to look at facts. The fact is, every person in existence has come through sex. Our seed for this particular body, the seed that grew us, came from our parents. The seed that grew who we are now came from our parents. It was not one seed. It was two. Sperm and ovum. Mother and father. So Krishna is that. Right here in the scripture. Know that I am the original Bijam of all existences. Krishna is the semen. Krishna is the ova. The egg and the sperm in every creature. Krishna, the power of God to create, is in sex. The next passage says, the buddhi of the buddhi matam. So I explained a little about buddhi, that it's related to Geburah on the tree of life. And I told you that directly translated, it means intelligence. But really, buddhi 
does not mean intellect in the way we experience it. It is an abstract, intuitive level of intelligence related to the consciousness. We call it the divine soul. In many religions, it's symbolized by a beautiful woman. Helen of Troy, Beatrice in the Divine Comedy, um, Eurydice, who Orpheus saves from the abyss, Persephone, uh, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, even Aphrodite and Venus in their ways represent that. This beautiful aspect of consciousness that's in us. Beautiful soul. This is Eve as well. Beautiful, pristine aspect of soul that is the embodiment of wisdom and divinity in us as a consciousness. That is buddhi. Buddhi matam means those that have purely awakened buddhi. In other words, buddhas. The word buddha means one who is awake. And it's derived from buddhi, which is consciousness. So buddhi matam are the awakened ones. Krishna is the consciousness of the awakened ones. So relate these two together. These are directly in the same passage. I am the original sexual aspect of all existences. I am the awakened consciousness of the awakened ones. These two go together and are inseparable. Sex and consciousness. This passage is very significant, but is always overlooked because it brings up things that people don't want to deal with. People want sexuality and religion to be separate. They cannot be. The final passage of the scripture says, and the teja of the tejas vanam. Teja is often pronounced with a Spanish accent as teja. But in Sanskrit, it's usually with a J, a very slight J, teja. This is another word that's very difficult to translate. It relates to fire, because in the tattvas that I explained, there's the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water. Fire is tejas, or tejas. Here, teja means power, virility, strength, prowess, ability. Have you noticed how in English, virility, which of course is sexual energy, is from the same root as virtue? There's a reason, because they come from the same place. This scripture reveals that. The teja of the tejas vanam. Just like buddhi matam means the awakened ones, tejas vanam means the powerful ones, the virile ones. And who are they? It isn't us. In this world, we have no power. We are quite powerless. Who are the ones that have power? Truly, they are masters. Buddhas. Bodhisattvas. Those who have enormous teja, virility, prowess, potency, the ability to command nature, both inside of themselves and outside of themselves. The master, Krishna, showed that through many miracles and exploits. The picture I showed you in the beginning showed him lifting a mountain over his head in order to protect his people. Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea. Krishna also parted a river. Same symbols, same powers. These are great masters. These are Tejasvanam. So Krishna is the power in any master. Krishna is Christ. The next passage of this scripture reads, I am the strength of the strong, devoid of Kama and Raga. I am Kama, which is not contrary to Dharma, O Lord of the Bharatas. So once again, I left the Sanskrit so that you can get the full meaning of these terms. The one for strength of the strong, I didn't leave in Sanskrit because it's pretty clear the meaning. 
But Krishna says, I am devoid of kama and raga. Kama is another word in Sanskrit that has different subtleties. It depends on its context, how you translate it. And the truth of that is right here. He says, I am devoid of kama. And then the next sentence says, I am kama. So it appears to contradict. What is kama? Sex. You ever heard of the Kama Sutra? Kama means sex. It can mean sex life. It can mean lust. It can also mean chastity. So it depends on the context. Naturally, with the mind that humanity has now, anytime they see the word sex, it is lust. So the Kama Sutra is used for lustful purposes, the world over. In fact, the only translation that's publicly available now is completely adulterated. It is not the actual scripture. It is a version that was adulterated by a Westerner in order to build up his own fame and wealth. It is completely adulterated, yet it's everywhere. It's one of those best-selling books that everybody reads and thinks it's a real scripture from India, but it isn't. It's packed with lies. It is a scripture of black magic. The real Kama Sutra has been hidden. So he says, I am the strength of the strong, devoid of Kama and Raga. Kama means sex life. Here he's saying, I am devoid of lust. There is no lust in Christ. There is no lust in any master, in any Buddha. And yet humanity looks at the images of the Buddhas and masters and sees lust because their mind is full of lust. So we see these images of Krishna, like this one, with his spouse. We see images of the divinities in consort with their partners sexually, and we see it lustfully because our mind is like that. But the gods have no lust. Devoid of raga. Raga means attachment. Grasping. To clutch, to pull, to hold. What is lust? Attachment to sensation. Kama and Raga work together. He says, I am Kama, which is not contrary to Dharma. Dharma also is very difficult to translate. It's kind of a common word now. There's even TV shows with the name Dharma. But the name Dharma is very deep in its implications. Used in this context, it means religious principles. But the true core of the word Dharma is truth, reality. When we hear religious principles, we think of a dogma, some list of rules that we have to follow. That is not real religion. That is the second law. The first law is the reality, the truth. In this level, physically, gravity is a law. It is a dharma. We have the dharma of gravity. We have the dharma of electricity, the dharma of magnetism. These are truths. They are energies in motion that we can learn to work with. And if we fail to ignore those, if we ignore those dharmas, we suffer. If you go and stick your finger in an electrical socket, you will get shocked because you ignored that dharma. Same here. Christ, Krishna, is kama, which is not contrary to dharma. Sex that is in harmony with truth, with religious principles. To me, this is the single most important line out of the entire Bhagavad Gita. 
Christ says, I am sex which is not contrary to religion. How is it that millions upon millions of people have read the Bhagavad Gita and become celibate? They missed this line. Or it was mistranslated or misexplained. Krishna says here, I am sex. So why do they renounce sex? If they want to know Krishna, if they want to know Christ, the power of creation, the power of the gods, it is in sex. It is in the sexual seed, which is Krishna. The problem is that we don't know what Dharma is. We only know lustful sex. We only know Kama with Raga, with attachment. And because of that, we misunderstand everything. So people renounce sex because they're trying to renounce attachment. They're trying to renounce desire. But they're also throwing away the keys to overcoming desire. The key to conquering desire is the middle path, which is what the Buddha taught. To not renounce sex, neither to indulge in it, but to walk in the middle. So Krishna says he is Kama. This image shows Kama Deva. Deva means God. So Kama Deva means God of love, God of sex. And of course, in this painting, we see a beautifully clothed man poised on top of a bird. And in his hands, he has a bow and arrow. And the arrow is fire. And what is the fire? Sex. It is rajas. It is passion. It is the ability to create. It is the first of the three gunas. The first modality of prakriti. Kamadeva sits poised on the bird in order to fire the fiery arrow into our hearts and minds and sex to inspire us with the impulse to create, to love. Does this remind you of anyone? Does it look familiar? It should. You ever hear of Cupid? Eros? If you've studied Greek mythology, you know that the one of the most primordial gods in Greco-Roman mythology is Eros. Not that little chubby boy who's mischievous and runs around shooting people with arrows in the cartoons. That's the same thing as the little baby Krishna stealing butter and the little baby Jesus in the manger. It's a cute symbol, but it's only a cute symbol. It's hiding a very profound truth about our inner nature and about the nature of spirituality. Eros is Krishna. Eros Cupid is the most profound, important symbol in Greco-Roman mythology. He's right in the middle of the Eleusinian mysteries, which were the most important mystery school of the Greco-Roman mythology. And the Orphic mysteries had some of this as well. Eros, of course, is Christ. Kamadeva, Krishna, who with his arrow penetrates the heart to inspire us with love. Now, of course, in both Hinduism and in the Greek and Roman traditions, these traditions were completely perverted by the minds of men and women. Because we couldn't comprehend divine sexuality without raga and attachment, without passion and lust, we perverted these symbols and made them into approvals of our degeneration. We converted these beautiful, pristine, pure symbols into a stamp or seal of approval saying, it's okay for you to be a degenerate. This is where we get the term erotic. And if you go to the erotic section of any store now, it is poison for your soul. Poison. 
Originally, the erotic mysteries were the purest aspect of divinity, of spirituality, of religion. Worldwide. In Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Christianity, in Judaism. The erotic aspect of those teachings was the most pure and most sacred aspect that was only given to those who earned it by working on themselves, by cleaning themselves of impurity. Most people are too lazy. We don't want to look at the war we have to wage in ourselves against ourselves. We don't want to fight against our lust and our pride. We want to approve them and embrace them. So we've converted these symbols into approval for degeneration. So Eros became a degenerate amongst human beings. And so did Kamadeva. That's why we have the modern Kama Sutra. That's why we have modern eroticism, which are pure 100% black magic. And will take you to suffer. But if we look deeper at these symbols, we see more about Krishna. Here he is playing his flute. The flute is very symbolic on many levels. It represents the spinal column. The, the flute is our own spine. Krishna blows his breath through the spine to play notes, to play music, the music of the soul. That breath is his energy. If we're totally distracted and absorbed in materialism, in our lust, in our pride, in pursuing things externally, in chasing women or chasing men, we can't hear those notes that he plays inside of us. If you learn to meditate, if you learn to harness the power of your own kama, you can hear the music of Krishna. That same message is the basis of the magic flute by Mozart. It is also the teaching of Eros. This is Eros on a Greek urn playing his flute. But Eros adds a beautiful element. His flute has two parts, a man and a woman. The most complete note that Christ can play is through a couple. Isn't it true that two voices in harmony are more beautiful than one? Love cannot exist in a vacuum. Love emerges as a magnetic electric force between two beings. That's what produces the sound. In the next image, we see Krishna with his lover. Radha. And here we see Eros with his. Psyche. Greek and Hindu. Same message. Same teaching. Different parts of the world. The point here is that this teaching is universal. Does not belong to any religion. It is in every religion. That's why Christ says, I am sex life, which is not contrary to Dharma. Dharma is universal. It is truth. Truth does not respect any boundary. Truth is not only in India. It is not only in Mexico. It is in the consciousness. Christ is that. The power of creation through sex. So to understand what that means, we need to understand what is dharmic kama. Here in this top image, we see Shiva in love with his wife, Parvati. And she's embracing a lingam, which is a very ancient symbol found primarily in Hinduism, but also found in the Greek mysteries, which is a symbol of the phallus united with the vagina. It is a sexual symbol. These two gods are representing that sex and love are divine, not animal, not lustful, divine. We make it animal because of our attachment, because of desire. And this is explained in the ancient scripture, the Shiva Samhita, which is like the Hathyoka Pratapika, another scripture from Hinduism that is primarily ignored these days because it says things that nobody wants to hear. 
Of course, nowadays you can go to any city in the world and find hundreds of yoga places, all different kinds. Hatha yoga, bhakti yoga, Bikram, Shivananda, Kundalini yoga, etc., etc., etc. None of them will teach you this scripture because they don't like it. Even though all their traditions originally came from it, and they just cut this out because they didn't want to teach it, because they didn't want to practice it. The scripture is quite short, and in the middle of it, it says this. I, the, the scripture is spoken from the point of view of the divinity. It's a dialogue from Shiva, who is Krishna, in his creative and destructive aspect. The scripture says, I am the semen. So right there, they stop, and they throw it out. And the ones that keep reading change it to make it something that they like. So the scripture says, I, Shiva, am the semen. Shakti, the goddess, is the generated fluid. When they are perfectly combined in the body through this practice, then the body of the yogi becomes divine, immortal. Ejaculation of semen, or orgasm, brings death. Preserving it within brings life. Therefore, one should make sure to retain the semen within. One is born and dies through semen, and this there is no doubt. Knowing this, the yogi must always preserve his semen. When the precious jewel of semen is mastered, anything on earth can be mastered. Through the grace of its preservation, one becomes as great as me, Krishna or Shiva. The use of semen determines the happiness or pain of all beings living in the world who are deluded by desire and are subject to death and decay. This is the ultimate yoga. So this is directly quoted from a Hindu scripture and explains the secret teaching that was never given publicly and that is ignored by all the famous yoga schools. What does it say? That Dharmic Kama teaches that one must preserve the force of Krishna and hold it as sacred. That force is the sexual energy. That means that we need to hold and transform that energy for him. Just as that energy can create, if we express it physically, it can create a child. If we retain it and transform it, it creates the soul. It becomes the vessel through which God can express in us. It is not easy, especially in the beginning. But as you learn and become trained, it becomes what it was always before, natural. So, all, elsewhere in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, It is lust, it is wrath, born of the energy of rajas, all devouring, all sinful, that now, that now thou is the foe here, that no thou is the foe here. So he's saying that the foe, the enemy in spirituality, is lust, is anger. And he continues, As fire is surrounded by smoke, as a mirror by rust, as the fetus is enclosed in the womb, so is this covered by it. Covered, O son of Kunti, is wisdom by this constant enemy of the wise and in the form of desire, which is greedy and insatiable. This passage is very profound. Synthesized in simple terms, it means this. Your power to awaken and become like a god is veiled by your lust. If you want to awaken and become like a god, you need to clear away the veil. It means you need to cleanse the lust off of your sexual power. That comes as a process of a war inside. Because lust is greedy and insatiable. Lust has many arguments to defend itself. Lust is very sneaky and infects even religions and spiritual organizations and gives itself a stamp of approval that it is right to be there. No scripture of white tantra or pure religion approves lust. None. So to advance in real spirituality, lust has to be purified, cleansed, removed. 
Further, he says, the senses, mind, and reason are said to be its seat. Veiling wisdom through these, it deludes the embodied. Therefore, O Lord of the Bharatas, restrain the senses first. Do thou cast off this sinful thing of fornication, which is destructive of knowledge and wisdom. Slay thou, O mighty arm, the enemy in the form of desire, hard to conquer. So the senses, of course, first we talk about the physical senses. We interact with our lives through our senses. Mind and reason are buddhi and manas. Unfortunately in us, our buddhi and manas are not pure. Buddhi in us Gebra is that very high aspect, the divine soul, which we have clothed in animal lust. We have buried it. It is stuck in the underworld. It is Iridice, who is trapped in hell. It is Persephone, stolen by Pluto, kept in suffering. And her hero, the great warrior, Orpheus, Heracles, Aeneas, has to go into the underworld to pull her out. That is his true love. He cannot save her if he lusts for her. He can only save her through his pure love for her. A love that is not attached. A love of chastity. It is a sexual love, but it is free of attachment. Veiling wisdom through these, it deludes the embodied. That wisdom is prana, Christ wisdom, the wisdom of the beyond. It is the highest aspect of knowledge. But in us, it is hidden because of our egoism, because of ahankara. Therefore, he says, restrain the senses first. Do thou cast off this sinful thing. So to restrain the senses does not mean to shut your eyes and close your ears and clamp your mouth shut and hide. It doesn't mean that. If you restrain the chariot, you can't go anywhere. Right? If you stop the horses, you stop moving. That's the example of Arjuna in the chariot. Those horses can represent the senses. For Arjuna to fight the battle, he has to move. He has to guide the horses, the senses, through conscious will to the battlefield to find his enemy and to slay him. To restrain the senses means to have conscious will over what you perceive, to be attentive, to be present, to be cognizant, to be self-remembering, not to hide. Remember, it's the middle path, not indulging, not repressing, not avoiding. To be in the middle, living our lives, pursuing our goal, but with conscious awareness of that. And then, do thou cast off the sinful thing? That is the orgasm. And that is physical, and it is emotional, and it is mental. Many people think, even in Hinduism and Buddhism, that it's just to restrain the physical expression of that energy. That is a lie. You can restrain just the physical part and still experience the energetic aspect of the orgasm. And it is still an orgasm. And you will awaken consciousness, but with your lust. And you'll become a black magician. Simple as that. A demon. In Sanskrit, they are called asura. It is someone who's awake, but has awakened through lust. Or anger or pride. But primarily lust. And he says here that this thing, fornication, is destructive of knowledge and wisdom. This is very clear. The ones who indulge in fornication, in sex, lack knowledge and wisdom. But they are abundant in suffering.
So finally, I'll read this quote from Master Samael, which he said, Ahamkara and Maituna are in fact the basis of a true yoga. Ahamkara, dissolution of the I, and Maituna is sexual magic. Behold the true synthesis of yoga. That is what is taught in the Bhagavad Gita. Dissolve the I, whose primary root is lust. And transform the sexual energy, whose primary method is through sex. This is Ahamkara and Maituna. Maituna is a Sanskrit word that means um, religious sexuality. The result of that work is that the person harnesses every atom of energy that they have and eliminates every atom of egoism that they have and they become a perfect expression of Christ. This is how all the great masters and angels and Buddhas and Divas have come to be. There is no other way. So finally, people always ask, how can I see this vision of Vishnu? And he explains it. He says, my dear Arjuna, this form of mine you are now seeing is very difficult to behold. Even the demigods are ever seeking the opportunity to see this form, which is so dear. The form you are seeing with your transcendental eyes cannot be understood simply by studying the Vedas, nor by undergoing serious penances, nor by charity, nor by worship. It is not by these means that one can see me as I am. My dear Arjuna, he who engages in my pure devotional service, free from the contaminations of fruitive activities and mental speculation, he who works for me, who makes me the supreme goal of his life, and who is without an enemy among living beings, he certainly comes to me. In that final passage, we see the three factors of any true path of yoga or religion. Most people who study religion do all the things he says that don't lead anywhere, <laughs> like all of us. Trying to do very serious spiritual practices, which are penances, like fasting, being vegetarian, circumambulating sacred grounds, adopting certain clothes or other aspects of lifestyle. Or we study the scriptures like the Vedas or the sutras or tantras. Or we enter a life of service, becoming a monk or a nun. Or we commit ourselves to doing certain types of worship practices like a bhakti yoga practice, uh, doing 100,000 recitations of our mantra every day, this type of thing. These are all fine and they're useful, but they don't lead one to union with God. They purify karma. And they can help achieve some degree of stability in the consciousness of a person. But for one who wants to know Christ, to experience Christ, to directly perceive the reality of Krishna, there is only one way to do it, and that is to die. You cannot do that. You cannot do what he says. Engage in his pure devotional service, free from contaminations of fruit of activities and mental speculation. You cannot make Krishna the supreme goal of your life if you have pride, if you have lust, if you have envy or jealousy. You cannot. Because right now, what we worship is our ego. Even when we are religious, we make our religion a food for our pride. We make our spirituality nourishment for our lust. We make our spirituality a support for our envy. No one wants to die. And that's the conflict that Arjuna is having on the battlefield in this image at the very bottom. Arjuna doesn't want to kill all his egos which are lined up on those elephants in the background. He sees them and says, those are my family. I've lived with them for all my lifetimes. I can't kill them. They are me. They are my blood. And we all are like that. We see the images of God and the beautiful teachings and we feel inspired and want to do it. But when we look in the mirror and when we look at ourselves and our behaviors, we say, oh, I can't change that. It's too much. Maybe later. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel better and meditate on that. Not today. 
maybe later God will give me the strength to meditate on my lust, but right now I don't feel like I can do it. It's too, it's too much. All of us suffer from that disease. And that's why we still suffer. Krishna says here, in order for us to come to see this form, the true face of reality, we have to die. And that's today. That death is psychological. It is to look directly in one's own face and to recognize one's own crime and to atone for it and to stop making the mistake and to never go back. That is very difficult, but it's the only way. And the only power that can make it possible to do it is Christ itself. And if we are fornicating, physically, emotionally, or mentally, wasting our energy through lust primarily, but also through pride and anger and envy, we will never have the energy to do it. The three gunas, rajas, sattva, and tamas, are the secret to spiritual advancement. But all three come from sexual energy. If you are depleting your sexual energy constantly, either physically through the actual act of orgasm and sex or masturbation, or you're wasting it emotionally through explosions of anger or lust or pride or attachment in your heart, or mentally through your fantasies and daydreams and wrong thinking, you will have no energy to work spiritually. None. And so you will be as an empty vessel without any life, just suffering. Through retention of those forces, you start to acquire a vessel through which Krishna can work in you. Krishna says, I am the seed. So if we save that seed and respect it, transform it, we learn how to utilize it, not repressing it and not indulging in it, but using it with respect. Then Krishna can work through us. This is what it means to say, he who works for me, who makes me the supreme goal of his life, and who is without an enemy among living beings. Do you notice how nowadays we all avoid each other? Pretty much. People are becoming more and more insular. We talk less and less face-to-face, -face and more and more by remote. First it was the telephone. Or first it was letters, then it was the telephone, then it was the fax, then it's email, now it's chatting and, and cell phones. More and more isolated. Why? Because it's easier for us to maintain a false image of ourselves to others. When we're face to face, the other person can see all of our defects, our pimples, our sagging belly, our gray hair. They can see everything about us that we don't want them to see. This is the whole thing with the online dating. It's all lies. Is everybody projecting an image of themselves that they want to show others, but when they actually meet the other person, you're not, they're not going to be anything like that. Those relationships are doomed to fail. Because there's no chemistry. There's no actual meeting. He who is without an enemy among living beings. Who is that? Does anyone know anyone who is without an enemy? And by enemy, we don't just mean someone who hates or kills. In any place where there is a conflict of any kind, that is an enemy. Most of us are enemies even with our own families built up resentments, envy, jealousy over lifetimes. And with our spouse, and with our children, and our parents, many places of conflict. So who is it that is without an enemy among living beings? Only Christ.
Only Christ loves equally and universally. Only Christ has no enemies. Even the devil he loves. So in order to come to Krishna, we have to become Krishna. There are many out there who say, if you just chant this mantra, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Rama Rama, or Hari Hari, then you do that 200,000 million times, then you will become like Krishna and be very close to him. Or if you are a businessman and you have all this wealth and you give all the wealth to build a temple to Krishna, then he will love you. And he will be dear to you. You, you will be dear to him and you will be protected by Krishna forever and ever. Lies. The scripture states it extremely clearly. Only the one who devotes every atom of his existence to becoming Krishna comes to Krishna. Now it sounds impossible. It sounds overwhelming. But it has been done. It has been done many times. And it can be done again. One only has to have the will to die. Psychologically. To realize that suffering is not the only way. That there is a better way. We don't have to just suffer and die in anxiety and lack of knowledge. It is possible to cast off suffering and to become that. And to do that, we have to work. It doesn't come by saying a prayer or saying a mantra or making a promise or giving all your money to a temple. It comes through work on oneself. Any questions? Yes. Um, most of the pictures I see, there's four horses, <laughs> and you see we present the four bodies of sin. I thought that's I, right. The, it can represent the four. Five, like five there. Right. This is the thing that can represent. Those horses can represent the five senses. Uh-huh. It can also represent the four bodies of the soul. It can represent the tattvas. It can represent. There are different levels of meaning there, depending on which tradition produced the painting, because uh-huh. they have different ways of studying the psychology. But in general, the chariot and the horses represent the body. You know, ourselves, our vessel, which includes the inner bodies. Because you can't separate the inner bodies from the senses. They're, they work with each other. Mm-hmm. Then when Orpheus turns around in action of desire and hence his loss of religion. That's right. In the Greek myth of Orpheus, he's pulling his spouse, his beloved, up out of the abyss, but in a moment of doubt, he turns to look back to see her and loses her. That represents an initiate who's working in the path, who's achieving some level of purification, bringing his consciousness out of the ego, but looks back out of desire, out of attachment, and he loses his work. And then he has to start again, and it's even more difficult. Very painful, but it happens. Yes. If arrows relate to Rajas, do then Kronos and Gaia relate to Tamas and Tattva? So the question is if Eros relates only to Rajas and if Kronos and who's the other one? Uh, Gaia. Gaia represent or relate to the other gunas. No, in fact, Eros is the capacity of all three gunas, just as Krishna is all three. Any god uses all three gunas. They aren't one or the other. Gnostically speaking, a demigod is a being who's achieved some degree of work in the path. So demi means part, partial. So if you're a partial god, it means that you've done some degree of work. You've you've achieved some degree of initiation, but not complete. Hmm? Yeah, it's related with, if you know about the three mountains, it's related to initiates working in the first mountain. And so that's related to creation of the solar bodies, the serpents of fire, and the serpents of light. Um, where do the lengthy quotes on slide 19 come from, on Dharmic Kama? The quote about Dharmic Kama comes from a scripture called Shiva Samhita. The scripture itself is only about five chapters long. It's very short. 
Uh, most of it's just about postures, asana, a little bit about breathing. Uh, the important passage about sexuality is repeated or is uh, included in its entirety in the back of the new edition of Kundalini Yoga by Samael M. Vior. And it's also on the Sacred Sex website. No questions from you guys? Is there any value of doing the alchemy during the day? Is there any value to practicing alchemy during the day? Samuel and Vior explained that the transmutation practice with a partner is most effective and produced at night during darkness because the energies are, are uh, veiled and hidden in such a way that they can ascend and work through the spinal column more easily because the solar light is not descending and working through the nadis. But certainly, if you practice during the day, you can utilize those forces that are harnessed in order to work on the ego. So if that's the only time of day you can practice, then you should use it. But if possible, it's better at night. It's, it's, uh, the energy is more effectively transmitted. So does looking back only relate to orgasm, or can you use your work in other ways? The looking back of Orpheus relates to a psychological phenomenon not physical. So when he looks back in the myth, it's related to his mind becoming hypnotized by his attachments. So that is a psychological symbol, not physical. It doesn't relate strictly to an orgasm. It relates to a psychological relationship. As an initiate, a person can still be holding their energy physically, but fall because of pride, because of lust, because of anger, even though physically they still are trying to maintain chastity. So falling or rising is primarily a psychological phenomenon. The physical component just stores energy, but it does not raise you up. It's the psychological work that raises you up. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong to consent in sex and lust in order to feel enough pain to change just as long as you have the will to make it through? I'm not sure I really understand the question. If if the question is about indulging in lustful sexuality in order to punish oneself, that would be a mistake. If you already know something is wrong, why would you keep doing it? Masochism is a very dangerous toxin. We all have it. Everyone punishes themselves out of guilt or remorse, but it's toxic. And if you know something is wrong, you better stop because the law is extra severe on people who do things that they know are wrong. It's like if you have a child and you've told them a thousand times, do not take a cookie out of the jar. And they keep doing it, your punishments are going to get more severe until they stop. So our divine guides are like that. Any other questions? Yeah, well, why do their masters descend on purpose knowing that because they want to gain more consciousness? That's right, they do. So. Yeah. Masters descend again in order to raise higher. And they take on more suffering and more pain and more responsibility, and it's harder and harder every time. But they do it because they want to reach higher degrees of light. But that's not the same as us, who are already fallen. We're already fallen. Why would we keep deepening our suffering? Yeah, what's that? Doesn't ascend or descend? Yeah, we're already demons is the point. So why deepen our suffering even more? That would be really foolish. And there are a lot of people who do that, who know it's wrong, and they just do it because they know it's wrong, and they hate themselves. And that's very toxic. It's going to result in very powerful consequences. So it's very smart. When you realize and feel something and you know it's wrong, stop. That's God telling you in your heart, don't do that. We don't listen. But the law is the law. Any other questions? I wore you out. <laughs> Just understand something. Krishna is not separate from you. That's a big deal. I know when we study religion and we study symbolism, it becomes a mental speculation. And he's saying right here, you cannot reach him through mental speculation. You cannot reach him through just studying the scripture, just analyzing things with your mind, your intellect. You cannot. 
If you want to know about divinity, about reality, you have to work on yourself. You have to change. It's the only way. There are many millions of people in every religion, including in Gnosis, who are just bookworms. And they may do practices, and they may seem very serious about doing penances and studying the scripture and doing charity and worshiping and showing up when they need to show up and doing what they need to do. But they're not going anywhere. And they may be people that you know, and it may be you. The key to successful work in Gnosis is to constantly self-evaluate, to analyze very honestly. And that's why in several of the books, the Master Samael said, put your hand on your heart and be sincere. Have you awakened your Kundalini? Have you spoken face to face with the divinity? Do you have the capability to access and perceive the truth directly for yourself? If you can do those things, then you are achieving something in Gnosis. If you cannot, you're making some kind of mistake that you need to analyze and revise and change. Any person is capable of it. And the chief obstacle is ourselves. We are Arjuna. And Krishna is saying, you're on the battlefield and you have to kill all of those demons, which are yourself, and that look like your family, and that look like your loved ones, but they are your enemies. They have to die. So study the Bhagavad Gita. It will help you. Thank you. Oh, one more? Okay. Any nocturnal pollution is, pollution is a product of lust. Even if it's not readily visible that lust was the cause, it is the cause. So it's likely that if a person's having wet dreams, nocturnal pollutions, and they're not seeing the cause, it's because they're not seeing the cause during the day. They're, they're having some kind of habit of perception or thinking during the day about which they have no awareness. So the way to cure that is to deepen self-observation and meditate more and find what it is that you're doing that's causing that energy to get out of control. Ultimately, the only cure for nocturnal pollutions is the maituna, is sexual transmutation with a partner. Let me make one last point. This is something I wanted to point out in this lecture. That reminds me. I'm glad you asked that. About dharmic kama. If you look at all the images I've shown you, you see something very significant that is overlooked by many tantric traditions, uh, especially the yogic traditions that are being brought to the West now. If I can get my tool to work here. Do you see all these images of Krishna with Radha? And all the images of Guru Rinpoche with Yeshit Sogyal, or you see all the images of Shiva with Shakti or Parvati. Do you realize something important about that? It's a man and a woman. It's not a man alone. It's not a man with a man. It's not a woman with a woman. It's not a person with an animal. It is a man and a woman. There's a reason. A couple male and female, represent two of the gunas, two of those forces. When they come together and unite, they activate the third force. The man is the projective force, masculine, who hunts for the woman. And the woman is the avoiding force who tries to avoid the man. But when he catches her and they unite, they are reconciled. They are harmonized. There you have three forces. That is the power of creation. That is what's represented in all of those ancient scriptures and paintings and images and symbols. Dharmic kama is the perfect matrimony, a union of a man and a woman. Dharmic kama cannot be achieved by a single person. A degree of it can be. That is, a degree of purity in oneself that can be achieved as a single person. 
And in ancient times, that was the prerequisite to enter into the stage of working as a couple. First, you had a period of time working single. In order to stabilize your mind, awaken consciousness, and start to gain some ability to manage your energy. Then when you had the ability to manage it and not lose it, then you would be introduced to a spouse, married, and you would work with your spouse. That was the ancient way. But of course, with our lust and our curiosity and our perversion, we took all that and ruined it. And those who hated sex and hated their spouse decided to try to work on their own. Or they decided to work with their best friend of the same sex. Or they decided to work with their animals. And they all have become black magicians and have been perpetuating their mistaken doctrines for centuries. Those teachings are everywhere. When you study Kama, when you study Krishna, and you study the sacred teachings, the vast majority of what you see will be degenerated. It will be garbage. If you really want to know about the science, you have to study the original scriptures, and you have to work in yourself and work hard. And the real scripture will be revealed to you. But it will not be revealed if you are continuing with perverse, degenerated habits. Krishna will not allow those elements to be brought into his temples, his real temples. So if you have attachment to practices or schools or techniques that belong to the degenerated traditions, you have to discard those things in order to receive the real teaching. You cannot continue with that. You have to stop. It's not allowed. So that's discussed in some of the other scriptures related with Krishna, where he describes in one of the chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, those who are on the mistaken path. Read it. I'm, I think it's chapter 7 or chapter 8. I don't remember. Yes? Are the three gunas related to the three traitors? Only in a very loose way. There are many um, symbolic representations of the power of three. The gunas are at the ultimate root of all trinities. So any trinity, even the three brains, you find relationships. But you can't say that one guna is definitively related to another brain because the reality is in our sexual center, we have all three gunas. In our emotional center, we have all three gunas because emotionally we create, we sustain, and we destroy. So the three gunas describe a process of the transformation of energy, and that happens in everything, in all three traders, in every ego, in every brain, in every body, in every dimension. It's everywhere. So this is the, the thing about trying to understand how these all fit together. It's not these three connect directly to these three. That's a, an intellectual approach, which is understandable, but that's not how nature functions. Yes? Does the sexual magic still work if the spouse has lust and fornicates, but you don't? Does sexual magic work if the, lust, if the spouse has lust and, does, and fornicates? But you don't. Well, we all have lust, and we all fornicate, even when we're trying to be in chastity. You can achieve great heights in this work, even if your spouse is not on this path at all and doesn't like it and fornicates and opposes you in it. You can still achieve a lot. Why is that? Because the basis of the work is not in the physical matter. It is in love. Krishna is the god of love. Sex is an expression of love. Should be, not lust. When you learn to truly love by harnessing your sexual power as the fuel for that love, you achieve the work. And you can do that to a degree as a single person. And you can do that to a greater degree working with a spouse who's not on the path. And you can achieve it to an even greater degree if your spouse is working with you. The question is never about what other people are doing, of whether you can do it or not. You will always be opposed, whether your spouse is doing it or not, or your family is opposed to it. They all hate it. They think you're a degenerate and a black magician. All your friends will reject it. None of that really matters, because the chief obstacle you have will be your own mind your own lust, your own pride, your own envy. Those are the bigger problems. 
whether you're married or single, or your spouse is in this work or not in this work, ultimately, it's irrelevant. What matters is, how are you using your own energy and conquering your own problems? That's what matters. We have to do that first and love everyone. We have to love them. Whether they're in the work or not, you have to love them. Was that it? There's one more. Would you be able to briefly discuss what are the different Hindu scriptures? The different scriptures from Hinduism? Briefly? <laughs> well, Hinduism has probably the richest tradition of scriptures in the world. Um, probably second to that would be Buddhism, which has many hundreds of scriptures. Uh, the primary Hindu scriptures would be the Vedas, the Shastras, the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, and another large collection of poems and poetic works. Those are the main ones. Hmm? The Ramayana, you mean? Ramayana. Yeah, that's part of the poetic works. So there are hundreds of scriptures. You would not be able to read them in your lifetime. There's too many. If you really want to understand Hinduism, study the Vedas. Those are the oldest and the most profound. And the, most of those scriptures in the Vedas are about Agni. And Agni means God of fire. That's Krishna. So they're very beautiful scriptures, but very, very difficult to understand with the intellect. To really grasp any of these scriptures, you have to meditate. So if you want to understand more about this lecture, take one sentence, meditate on it. Take a sentence that, that pinged your heart, where in your heart you felt something. Even if it was really uncomfortable, you felt, I don't like that. That's exactly the one you should meditate on. Because it's pointing at something in you that you don't want to deal with. So deal with it. Take that scripture, read it, digest it. Take it into yourself and chew on it for a week, for two weeks, until you start to really get it. And when you meditate on it, you visualize the meaning, you put that scripture in your mind, you analyze your three brains, you relax. And let the images come. Let the mind show you things, your consciousness. Let your imagination open up, and it will show you new things. A lot of it will be garbage. But if you're patient and persistent and you know how to meditate, you'll start to have insight. You see, every one of these passages is a door. They're all doorways. Any passage from the Bhagavad Gita is a doorway to Krishna. The same is true of the Bible and the Vedas. These words, even though they're translated into English, they have a connection to where they came from. And they came from Krishna. And if you meditate on them very seriously and very persistently, and you earn it, Krishna will show you more, will teach you what you need to know. And I can give you uh, assurance of that because I've experienced that. That's how we teach these lectures. We're not making this stuff up. We study, we meditate, we reflect, we try to learn from the source. Not from theories. We don't read other commentaries. We don't read other authors. We read the scriptures. We study the scriptures. Everything is there. Because those scriptures are doorways into the consciousness, not people's opinions. We don't have time for opinions. This planet is about to undergo a tremendous cataclysm. This entire society, everything we know, is going to be taken away. No one knows when, but it will happen. So why waste time on foolishness, on opinions and debates? We need truth. We need dharma, the real thing. So let's cut through the garbage and get to the point. All right? Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. 
thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.